below. I just wanted to say how happy I am that you could all come for the rededication of the Margaret Riker Bush Lounge. Um, she meant a lot to all of us here at Bristol. I'm Paulette Howard, the current president of the Bristol Community College Council, part of Massachusetts Community College Council. And Margaret was um, like a steadfast rock for us. Um, we wouldn't have this lounge if she hadn't worked really, really hard for the faculty and staff so that we'd have a place to congregate. And um, so I'm so happy and appreciate the fact that so many of you came today to celebrate with us. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jack Sprager. He's our current president here at Bristol Community College. And he's going to rededicate the lounge. All right. Well, welcome everyone. What a great tribute, and I welcome you to uh, back. You've seen some changes for some of the people who haven't been here in a while, and uh, uh, we're very proud of the uh, campus and of the college. We're up to 8,100 students now, uh, and a new uh, record for the college as uh, people are uh, recognizing not only the accessibility and affordability, but more important, the high quality that's available here at, uh, at Bristol. And uh, you all have been a, a part of it, and I want to thank you very much. Uh, you'll be hearing from some other wonderful people as well. Uh, I, uh, Paulette asked me to uh, say a few words on this uh, wonderful occasion. Uh, unfortunately, I did not know uh, Margaret. Um, uh, many uh, stories have come my way, as you can imagine. And um, what stands out, of course, is her uh, passion and her uh, commitment to uh, learning and to uh, the uh, learning process and to Bristol Community College. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, when she had conversations, not everyone, always, they didn't always agree or people didn't always uh, agree with her perspective or she with theirs, but uh, that's to be expected on a college campus, right? Where we share ideas as part of the learning process. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, that, that, that emphasis uh, comes out again and again and again, as uh, you can imagine. This is my ninth year now, it's hard to believe. Wow. Eileen's been gone nine years, uh, it's hard to believe that. Uh, but uh, all throughout those nine years and continuing, I hear uh, these stories about Margaret. And uh, one of the first occasions I had to visit uh, was this room and uh, saw the picture of, uh, of Margaret. Uh, we're putting up a new one. and. Uh, we're going to have another uh, dedication later on if the, if the cuts allow us to uh, continue with some construction and we're going to have another, uh, a new uh, uh, faculty staff lounge uh, named for Margaret, of course, and uh, uh, you'll be invited to another dedication. I'm not sure when that's going to be. It was supposed to be uh, last year, let alone uh, what's coming with the cuts. But uh, the important thing is to keep uh, Margaret's memory alive and. Uh, Jules called and asked about the, uh, this, and we instantly agreed and offered any help that we could possibly uh, uh, provide. So I, I uh, don't want to take any more time. I, I think it's a wonderful occasion. We rededicate uh, this uh, space, but also uh, beyond this space, the memory of, uh, of Margaret. And uh, as I walk by our uh, New Bedford uh, campus, I see the, mur the mural on for uh, Margaret. and. Uh, it's just wonderful that her spirit lives uh, and continues to live and imbue our activities at uh, Bristol Community College, but throughout the community as well. So, uh, Paulette, I thank you for this opportunity, and uh, uh, I'm very grateful to have a chance to uh, say a few words uh, for someone I didn't know, but someone I admire uh, all, of, all the more. Thank you. We've invited a few people to share their remembrances. Um, you can all do that after our invited uh, guests. And um, the next person is New Margaret, probably better than any of us, Jules. Who is, uh... Thank you, Paulette, and thank you, all of you, for coming. Jack, God, I don't think I could really be able to handle another dedication. <laughs> I, uh... I first of all want to thank uh, the people who put this together, Paulette Howard certainly uh, for doing a marvelous job, Joe Murphy for put, putting together, for me at least, that heartrending movie, as he calls it, that's going on down there. 
Diane Yehoe, who is very <laughs> instrumental in getting this going. It all started with a, a little event that occurred uh, in 2007 uh, when uh, uh, Princess Diana was honored by her two sons. Princess Margaret was a, sort of a princess. I think uh, her two sons <laughs> wanted to take part in this as well. I, again, want to thank everybody for coming. I, it's a large crowd. And uh, she'd be very honored to see her pictures up here. Uh, her two sons, of course, Matthew and Justin, uh, she would love to see what they look like now, which is really amazing. Anyway, I'm going to be very brief, and I mean brief, but I want you all to know that Margaret Reichabush was just as spectacular as the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> And I live in New Bedford. I've lived in that area now for 40 years. I want to stay away from numbers at this point. But uh, whenever I walk downtown to the post office or to Freestones or to the bank, whatever, I sort of play this little game with myself. Can I possibly make it down here with somebody, you know, not recognizing me? And uh, I taught for many years to many students, and so did Margaret. And very often, I have an interesting uh, occurrence. I will meet somebody on the street will say, Mr. Reichabush, I, I remember having you and, and your wife as, as, as teachers at Bristol Community College, and she was such a wonderful teacher. <laughs> <laughs> they were right. <laughs> anyway, I just want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, this is rather moving for me. I'm looking at two other people in this room who were here when the college began in the fall of 66, Al Roy and Jim Pelletier. I can remember when I first met Margaret in 68, she pointed to Al Roy, she said, I know him, he went to Stonehill with me, he was a basketball player. And she remembered, remembered you from that period. We're going back too far in history. There are a few other people who want to speak, and I want to thank Eileen, who I'm afraid didn't quite know she was going to be speaking until she talked to me the other day on the phone. Anyway, I want to thank all of you, and, uh, and I'm sure she would too. Thank you. I just wanted to take a minute. Um, Jules thanked me and Diana Yowie and of course Joe with um, that spect spectacular video he put together. But I have to also thank the other officers of our union that worked diligently on this entire get together. Um, Susan McCourt, our new secretary. Greg Sotheris, our board member. And Gabby Adler, our vice president. So the whole team uh, just did a, a remarkable job at working very hard to put this event together. And I really want to thank you. And now for the person who's responsible for making this lounge possible, along with Margaret, I think there was a lot of um, debating about this <laughs> way back when. But, um, Eileen Farley is our president emeritus, and uh, she certainly uh, worked a lot, very hard here for 25 years? 22. 22. Okay. That was close. <laughs> but she's agreed to uh, speak, even though Jules told me she was asked, and I didn't know that. But Eileen is an eloquent speaker, and she, I know she, if she started telling stories, we'd be here all afternoon. <laughs> but we'll let her say her little piece. Thanks, thanks, Paulette. You know, this morning I woke up at a very early, uh, uncustomary hour, facing the prospect of writing remarks for two occasions, and I said to myself, Eileen, you retired nine years ago. What are you doing? And then I remembered how thrilled I am always to come back and how delighted I really am to be included in both of these celebrations today for two really terrific people who contributed so much to ECC. And as I was preparing my remarks, I couldn't help but thinking what an opportune time it was to uh, rededicate something to Margaret Reichenbush. You know, all during the uh, primary season and the election season, I thought of her so many times. Uh, she would have just been out of her mind with <laughs> Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and the whole long season of elections going on. She was such an incredible political junkie. She had 10 more stickers on her car. I think her car is a really a complete history of elections since the time 
time of the 60s. She'd be aggravating the few Republicans in our midst with her politicking, I'm sure. And most important, and seriously, uh, she would be challenging her students to pay attention to the election. She'd be giving them opportunities to be informed. Uh, she'd be helping them to, to deal with the political rhetoric in a more critical way. And I think uh, she, she, that would be her style. She was a fabulous teacher, and she used every opportunity like that to help students not only to communicate better, but to become better citizens. And by the way, as much as she was such an uncompromising advocate for people and ideas she believed in, she really never imposed herself or her views on students. Every once in a while, I went to her class at her invitation, and I was always impressed that given the passions she felt about things, she was always so respectful of students who might have differing views or uninformed views. You know, students certainly always knew where she stood, that's for sure. Uh, but they loved her, and they knew that she was a tough teacher, that she respected them, and uh, she, she certainly was one of the best in teaching. She wasn't always so forgiving, of course, with college presidents and <laughs> colleagues, as you know. Now, I suppose we really remember Margaret most as a vigorous, uh, for her vigorous advocacy for faculty and her fierce devotion, really, to faculty rights and responsibilities. President Sprague, I don't know whether you are lucky or unlucky to have, uh, to have missed working with her. <laughs> On the one hand, uh, she, when there were issues, she could re really be a very formidable adversary. But on the other hand, she was such an honorable one. Sometimes I used to get really aggravated with her. She had a capacity to go after little details in the contract and haunt me for week after week after week about things. And I'd want her to go away. But I always knew in the end that when she made a deal with you, she stuck to it. Her word was really always perfectly good. I think what, one of the things that was notable about Margaret as a, really as a labor leader, that she was not only uh, tough and demanding with management, but she was just as tough with her own membership, as I'm sure many of you can attest to. I also know that um, with the MCCC statewide, back in the early days, that was kind of a bastion of male privilege, you might say. And she really worked behind the scenes very hard to see that they addressed issues that were affecting women and minorities. So she was really there at the statewide level as well as at the campus level, always seeking that justice and fairness. One thing that many people might not know uh, about Margaret was how often she also advocated for employees and for students, people that really had no association with her union. Sometimes uh, she'd come by to complain or to tell me about a situation. And to be honest, once in a while, I'd have an unspoken thought in my head saying, you know, why don't you mind your own business? <laughs> But you know, you couldn't resist her because you really knew that what she was after was some measure of justice or fairness or compassion for somebody. Margaret was really, truly uh, an outsized and wonderful character whom I admired and loved. Uh, in addition to everything else, she was also a lot of fun. She died too soon. I hope that this room named for her will be a wonderful way of keeping alive those ideals that she believed in and fought for so strongly. And thank you for asking me to be here today. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm remiss. I'm sorry. Ron Lister, I forgot you. He's our membership chair. And, um, he worked long and hard with Margaret, has a lot of stories. Um, one day she was very upset about something. I don't remember what. She might have been in D building and I'd caught her on the way out. And I said, and she was, you know, she would get really upset sometimes. And I said, Margaret, you've got to, you've got to calm down. And she looked at me, she says, don't you tell me to calm down. Don't you ever tell me to calm down. <laughs> no one tells me to calm down. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll back off of this one. <laughs> And um, when she was advocating for something, she was um, a very strong advocate. And uh, we're happy that she did a lot of the hard work and took on a lot of the hard issues. And um, next we have Joe Murphy, retired professor of English. 
and um, he's coming. Yeah. I'm here to correct an omission. Uh, one of my oldest and dearest friends is here, and perhaps because I'm so close to her, I overlooked been overlooked him talking about Alan and Jim. Uh, Tanya Nicolette is here. Uh, Tanya Nicolette. <laughs> Tanya Nicolette and Margaret were very close friends for many, many years. As I said, I want to stay away from numbers. Uh, she actually hired me. No one in this room can say that. <laughs> no one in this room has been here that long. Anyway, I just wanted to make that correction because if I didn't, I might be dead tomorrow. <laughs> Whoa. Excuse me. Uh, there's so many things I'd like to say that I won't be able to say any of them. Uh, <coughs> I got to know Margaret when I got elected to be chapter president and uh, <coughs> much to the chagrin of Leo. Anybody remember Leo? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, much to the uh, outrage of uh, who, a man who later became my good friend for two years, Sal Piazza. Oh, yeah. Sal died uh, 20 years ago today. So there's another memory uh, for this week. And uh, during those two years that he served as director and I served as chapter president, and Margaret was very patient with me and taught me everything she could. Uh, Sal and I became close friends eventually. Um, and I think he forgave me. I don't know. <laughs> Margaret was wonderful to work with. Uh, we did that, you know, for the next God knows how many years. She was, in 1985, the first recipient of the Butler Award, uh, the union's highest award to a chapter leader. And she was the first choice for the new award, and the natural choice. She was the choice that they had to give. I think it was nobody else, you know? I mean, she was it. Uh, and that was very true, I think, the rest of her life. Uh, she absolutely advocated for everybody. She believed wholeheartedly that action should be taken on her principles. Uh, she, like all of us, paid lip service uh, to equality, to uh, gender equity. Uh, she tried to do everything she could to stop racism, and uh, she worked very hard on this campus. Some of you, not in the union, will remember an effort that she made on behalf of women who were being uh, assaulted, basically, uh, and took some severe action with the help of President Farley, uh, who she respected tremendously. Uh, <clears throat> Eileen was wonderful. And uh, especially when Margaret was persuading her. Uh, <laughs> I remember coming out of Eileen's office once after Margaret had uh, dissolved into tears uh, over the plight of a part-time teacher who had no health insurance. And uh, Eileen had come to the rescue. And Margaret gave me the elbow and said, you know, hey, pretty good, huh? <laughs> she was a wonderful actress. But the act was always based on what she thought was true. And I was thinking, what would she do today? You know, here's today's paper. Nice picture. But Jack's doing what he can. But the administration really can't do a lot about what goes on in this state. And I, what, would, what would Margaret say today? I wish more of the younger people from the college were here. I look around and there's an awful lot of old farts here. <laughs> the younger people have got to get moving on this. Uh, when Margaret was hired, 74% of the state budget, 74% uh, of the college budget was state money. Today it's less than 40. It's like an iceberg under a polar bear, and the polar bear is going to die. If things keep going the way it's going, uh, it, is, it seemingly is an, you know, just irretrievable loss. Why did they even call it a state college? You know, what's happened? Uh, it's going to continue. And Margaret, I think today, would say, you've got to get doing something. You've got to get off your butt, and that's not the way she'd put it. <laughs> and you've got to get out there. Uh, the administration can't do it. They cannot. They will support uh, button wearing, uh, letter writing, petition gathering, uh, mild demonstrations. They cannot support job actions. 
Uh, we had a uh, commissioner of education here once who told the presidents, remember this? Uh, he said, when we're cut, we bleed. I still have the memo. He sent it to all the college presidents. When we're cut, we bleed. And what he meant was, when the state cuts us like this, and it was horrendous, as it will be, probably worse than it is now, he meant you make the students suffer. Show the students what really is happening. The presidents, of course, didn't do it. The president's job was to make sure that nobody saw any pain, not even a bruise. We were cut, we did not bleed, and he was gone in about two months to another state. Uh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? She, Margaret worked politically, and one of the things she did was she tried to elect candidates that would help, and I'm sure they tried. I'm sure they did. She put the bumper stickers on the vehicle, as was mentioned. She wore the buttons. Uh, she was no Pollyanna, though. You know, she certainly didn't think everything was going to get better, and I don't think she'd be surprised if she was here today yeah. at the State of Affairs. You've got to do something. You know, it's so sad to see this place uh, headed the way it's headed. Absolutely, this college depends for its very lifeblood on part-timers. And Margaret's, one of Margaret's chief concerns was health insurance for part-timers, job security, appointment rights. Many of those things happened to some degree when we got the DCE contract through the strike that she worked so hard for. She worked harder, of course, for women with the sex equity suit. You know, and if you are female and you work for this college, you owe her a real debt of thanks for what she did on that. Uh, but, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, I'd like to see the college bleed. I'd like to see the students hurt. I'd like to see the community outraged. Uh, I think my brother lives in Minnesota. Two of his sons attended the University of Minnesota. It is a premier school. The programs are excellent. The citizenry in the area believes in it. Margaret graduated with a, uh, got a uh, master's at Boston College. I got my uh, BA there. At that time, BC was trying to be more than the alternative for poor, lousy Irish kids. Uh, <laughs> And now it, of course, has become one of the elite colleges in Boston uh, that I think leans on us and crushes us. You know, the public schools have got to do something. So take some action, do something. Think of Margaret. Eat in this room, enjoy it. It was a long fight getting it, uh, and I'm glad she did. But, uh, anyway, thank you. Sorry to harass you over all this. See you later. Thank God. And now we have uh, Mary Costello, who's a dear friend of Margaret. Uh, I believe they taught together and might have gone to school together at one point in time. I'm not sure about the history, but I know it goes way back. And um, you don't have to get too specific. Oh, okay, no dates. No dates. Mary. Thank you. Some of you are probably wondering who I am and why I'm here, but every 10 years they drag me down from the North Shore to say a few <laughs> words about Margaret, so I'm looking forward to the next, uh, the rededication of the next library. Of uh, Margaret and I met a uh, long time ago in 19 whatever uh, at Boston College, and we, uh, we were friends ever since then. Uh, we spent a great deal of time, by the way, in lounges, and some of them actually were uh, faculty lounges. <laughs> Many of them, of course, were not. Many of them had names like the Elliott Lounge on Mass Ave in Boston. <laughs> Margaret actually got me my two teaching jobs. Back in those days, things were pretty informal. And I had been looking around for a job, and she called me one Friday morning and said, Mary, do you want to teach uh, part-time at Chamberlain Junior College? She was there at the time, full-time, and there was a part-time job, three courses, somebody had left. So I said, sure, and that very day, I went down and I met three English classes, and uh, afterwards, and I taught them, and then, uh, I don't know what I said, but then I went in and met the dean, and I had that job, and that became a full-time job for uh, several years. And I, I learned so much from, from Margaret in, uh, in those days about, uh, about how to teach, about how to treat students. Um, 
We did a lot of talking, sharing. They were not methods classes per se, or seminars, or anger management classes, or any of those things. They were just sitting around in the faculty lounge, or even the other types of lounges, and talking about the experiences that we had in, uh, in our classes. And I just learned an enormous amount. In fact, sometimes, those sessions would end up in Chinatown in the wee small hours of the morning. And uh, as I say, learned a lot. The second job I got, she got me again because I was no longer teaching. She had accepted a job here. She was leaving me. And I had left Chamberlain, which had gone off into the vapor of, uh, of uh, junior colleges. And I had been calling schools through the yellow pages in Boston. As I said, it was pretty informal in those days. And I was not lucking out. It was only like two days before classes were starting. So the last one was a school named Bay State Junior College. I had no idea what it was. So I said, OK, Margaret, you call them. Let's change my luck. So she called. She got the dean. He said, well, come in. I went in, and I stayed there for 19 years. <laughs> it was amazing. But it all worked, and uh, a lot of that was obviously by uh, the help that I got from, from Margaret. She left, as I said at that point, and came down here to start a new life and embark on a new job, a new husband, a new family, and a new life. And fortunately, she still included me in that life. So, uh, As I said before, I watched Margaret, and I listened to her teach, and I watched her with her students as she would joke with them as she would talk seriously with them uh, as the situations warranted. She worked hard with those students who needed help. And she also fought hard for the students who might be considered outside the mainstream of society. Those were the ones probably she fought, with, uh, fought for, actually, the hardest. So the passion that you saw for her students down here began uh, very early in uh, Boston's Back Bay. She brought her uh, passions, as you know, too, to politics as well. And she supported groups that were a little bit to the left of center, or maybe more than a little bit to the left. She supported groups mainly that fed and clothed people, even if they were on President Nixon's uh, enemies list. She was extremely loyal to her friends, often defending them against any perceived criticism. One time, earlier in their relationships, Margaret and Jules came up to my apartment in, in uh, Alston. And uh, Jules, I think it was, spilled something on the floor and uh, asked for something to wipe it up with. I couldn't find anything to wipe it up with, so I gave him some aluminum foil. <laughs> so, <laughs> so later on, I guess the next day, Jules said to Margaret, well, it wasn't that weird. All she had was aluminum foil to pick something up. And Margaret got very huffy and looked at him and said, well, she didn't know we were coming. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good, that's a good friend. <laughs> of course, her greatest love was for her family. Her love for her sons is evident in the wonderful young men that they have become. And I suppose Jules had something to do with that also. <laughs> One of the things I miss on a daily level about Margaret is her sense of humor and her love of irony. We would laugh at inflated language or misled or pompous uh, conversation. Uh, one, one example was an English teacher that we had while we were at Chamberlain. And, uh, he knew very little of this guy, but he would sit and he would listen to us discuss uh, the, you know, the great Gatsby or Hemingway or Mark Twain or somebody in novel. And he just, I think for the first time in his life, heard about symbolism. So one of his students one day, and John is uh, relaying this story to us, one of his students one day said, excuse me, what does Fitzgerald mean when he says that Gatsby is wearing a pink, sh a pink suit? And John, instead of just saying, it was probably just a descriptive term, said, well, when you say someone wears a pink suit, it means he's a hypocrite. <laughs> so there are probably 50 people out there who think this is what this means. So ever since then, of course, Margaret and I went around. If somebody got a little pompous, we would refer to them as wearing a pink suit. So. <laughs> All right. I think I'm just about done. Besides being a mother, a wife, a teacher, a union leader, 
a lover of animals, and a defender of the downtrodden, Margaret was fun. She was fully alive, as you know, and she was completely human. She had an exotic beauty and a style all of her own. And whatever lounge she is hanging around in these days is surely a better place for having her there, just as we were all better for having her with us. Thank you. I don't know if I should say the cemetery story of Williamstown. We were all down at the Purple Pub. Purple Pub burnt down. It hasn't been the same in Williamstown since. However, we knew that um, August is a big month for uh, seeing all the uh, star shooting stars. And if you've ever been to Williamstown, it's probably the brightest lit community on the face of the earth for a tiny little town in the middle of the Berkshires. So we decided we had to find a place where we could see the heavens. And so somebody suggested, let's go down beyond the cemetery. So we're walking down, was it Spring Street, and Margaret's out in front. And I don't know, there probably was seven or eight of us walking down to the other side of the cemetery where it was fairly dark. And we get down, we're fairly close. I said to Chris Howarth, who teaches here part-time, I said, Chris, let's go this way. I think it's shorter. So Chris and I, we kind of diverged from the group, and we got to the cemetery oh, probably three minutes ahead of them. It had been raining, but had cleared up. We had our umbrellas. And I looked at Chris, and I said, let's hide. <laughs> he said, let's hide? I said, yeah. He says, OK, you take that tombstone. I'll take this one. I said, no, 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 no. We're both going to get behind this big one, this big one. So we both got down between, behind the big tombstone, and we had our umbrellas, of course. I said, OK, when they get closer, we're going to jump up and scare them all. Well, of course, unfortunately, Margaret was in the lead. She had been from the beginning. And she's walking down, and they were all talking, and she's telling everybody what to do. And she was an in-charge person, always. So both Chris and I jumped up and put up our umbrellas. And she looked at us, and she screamed, of course. And then she said, blankety blank blank, and I'm going to get you back for that. <laughs> I guess I could say what she said, but it's very, um, I won't. But um, she was a lot of fun and always our leader. And if anybody else has any anecdotes or little stories to tell, um, you're certainly welcome to do so. It's open mic. <laughs> and thank you again for coming. I wasn't planning on this, but it's almost impossible not to want to join in on this a bit because Margaret had more energy than anyone I ever met. Or any age group you want to mention. She was, it wasn't just in charge, it was in charge with this bubble around her of energy and fun and all that. Um, but one of the things that I, that I was new to the game when I came and I met Joe and I said, what does this union do? And Joe, Joe told me, the next thing I know I'm out on a DC strike and I learned what the union did. But to be in the Mesa meetings back in those days and watch Margaret across from Eileen, you know, bright red in the face and, and yelling and screaming and yet at the same time all that respect was confusing to a young person. <laughs> and it was even worse in the office. I can remember going into the union office and catching Joe and Margaret about to kill each other and thinking my whole world was going to fall apart because these were two people I admired so much, and incredibly much. And if they were, you know, and of course none of it was real, it was just the passion that they both carried for things. But one little story would give it away too. Margaret always kept me very honest. And um, uh, you just never knew what she would say. I think that was part of what the fun was there. And I remember saying, you know, in the young, just the two of us in the office, and I said, Margaret, it, it really isn't a good idea that we get 3% raise, and it's across the board. I said, you know, some people make three times as much as I do, and they're going to get that much more, and I, I'm going to get this amount. And Margaret looked right at me, and she just said, F you, which I won't say the whole thing, <laughs> right to my end, she just said, I want that money. <laughs> Um, I, I haven't recovered yet, I mean, uh, but uh, 
<laughs> but uh, I, I think there's something very synonymous with Margaret and BCC. I don't think that can be separated. There are several people in here that we can say that about today. But what an indelible mark. And man, she earned it every step of the way. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Gilbarg. I teach sociology here. And I was hired in 1969. So Margaret had been there at BCC for one year when I was hired. And um, I'm here today partly because of her, and I want to tell that story. Um, I was politically active at the time, as I am now, and um, those were the days of campus protests and SDS and so on. And we had some administrators in the college, the dean of faculty at the time, and the administrator in my, they're not, they weren't not the same as our current division chairs, but it's the equivalent level, who were very, very conservative politically. and. They came after me like a ton of bricks immediately when I started to teach there. Within two months, they were complaining about the readings I was using in class and trying to whip me into line. And um, at the end of my first year, I was nearly fired. And the only reason I was rehired was because a lot of my students went in and talked to the president. And he said, I'll give you another chance. But these folks did not give up. And by the start of my third year, I was on a terminal contract scheduled to be fired because of my political beliefs. And it was a classic case of individual politics being put ahead of academic freedom and free speech, essentially. And um, that would have happened, except that Margaret, along with a small group of other faculty who had embraced me from the time I started at BCC and were in my corner. And one of the people that's here today is Tanya Nicolette, who was part of that group as well. And Tanya and Margaret and two or three other people went to the president. And they said, listen, you are making a big mistake. You've got to reevaluate this guy. And they were very insistent. And after a while, he agreed that there would be a re reevaluation process and students would be called in to testify, both written and in person. And that process happened. And um, the end result was that I was rehired, and I'm here today. Um, Margaret was in my corner, as Tiny was. And that was the difference in that particular case. If people, if she and Tanya and the others had not been willing to stick their neck out for me, I would have been out of a job, and the school would have lost whatever I had to contribute, and it would have been simply because of my political beliefs. Um, it's a sad chapter in a way in the history of BCC, but it's also a happy chapter because the end result was that because of Margaret's intervention and Tiny's intervention and others, we ended up reaffirming that commitment. And ever since, BCC has been extremely supportive to me. So I wanted to recognize that. And just the importance of having, as a faculty member, having someone in your corner who's willing to stick their neck out even if they're going to get into trouble for it themselves who's not just concerned with protecting their own situation, but is willing to fight for what's right and for fellow faculty interests is really important. So, and I'm living proof of that. So thank you. I beat you, Alan, sorry. Hi, Sandy Ligren. I coordinate Duff Studies, and you might be wondering why I'm up here. You might know that I never had the pleasure of knowing Margaret. But I'm here because of Margaret. What you might not know is her last sabbatical brought the original sign language certificate here to BCC that I went, then got hired for several years later and turned into Deaf Studies, which has a ripple effect in so many positive ways that I can't even begin to describe on our community and in our state for deaf people. So beyond being an advocate, clearly she was entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, interested, curious, for her to seek out and have the wherewithal to see that this was a field that was up and coming and needed and planted the seeds for me to come in and change our region for the better. And I wanted you to remember that about Margaret as well. That was not a paid advertisement. Uh, I am Powers, I'm gonna make it real brief, although I can talk for hours. We're gonna hear some music and I am a musical fan. Um, I want to say two things. It's because Dan Gilbart mentioned getting fired, that I'm here at this podium. Because I think people have forgotten that the characteristic of a great teacher is not only being fired, 
but being executed. The, the, the person that I studied for years, Giordano Bruno, was born alive for his teachings. He went around Europe teaching against Aristotle. Christ is an example. Socrates is an example. And this idea that somehow we've all changed and we now value teaching is really ridiculous. But I do want to say one thing. I would not have ever taught at Bristol if it were not for Jules. Because, of course, I was fired on a yearly basis in my early career. And there was a man at the University of California who said, if you go out into public teaching and you are not fired in three years, you're not doing your job. Uh, but Margaret had a wonderful classroom. I wanted to make one mention of her classroom because I don't think it's been mentioned. But she would give speeches on, uh, each year. Uh, she would have the students give speeches and, uh, on something they knew well. And so, of course, the cops all wanted to speak about their guns. You know, this somehow relates to the bushies and everything else. But So they would get up there, and Margaret made such wonderful, wonderful assignment that, yes, you could speak about your gun, but you had to have no bullets in it. You had to have, back then they had, you know, generally the Colts, etc. You had to have the chamber out, and you had to have it pointing away from the audience. So it was so difficult and so unmanning in some way that no true NRA uh, member would ever give a speech with his gun hanging out there behind us. It was a wonderful, wonderful assignment and Margaret invented it. Thank you. <laughs> this is turning into quite a wonderful love fest, but we're running out of time. And uh, something I've always wanted to say to a crowd of people, ladies and gentlemen, the Rolling Stones. However, <laughs> however, I do want to say, ladies and gentlemen, the dancing dogs. Matthew, Margaret's son, is the bass player. This is a group of musicians who played together for about 15, 16 years. This was Margaret's favorite band. <laughs> Dedicated to Matt's father, Jules. Administration. Uh, used to show up uh, at a rehearsal with a bottle of bourbon. Who, Jules? Yeah. Come on, you guys. We're gonna finish this tune. She was shy, she believed. One thing, uh, one thing, Barbara would like for many of you to do. I realize it's only about. Uh, you know, quarter to three, but she enjoyed people dancing, so you're welcome to do that. You know, this is flip loops, okay? There's, there's a mini bar, bar, mini bar over there. Enjoy yourself, okay? I still can't believe it's been 10 years, and happy all the events that have taken place in the past 10 years. 9-11, uh, the Bush administration, the Red Sox winning the World Series. One of my fondest memories as a kid, uh, I think it was around, it was 75 there in the series, World Series, right? And I was roughly six years old at the time. I'll never forget my mother jumping up and down on the bed. Woohoo! The Red Sox. So that was my <laughs> introduction to the Red Sox culture, and I've been a fan ever since. So I'll never forget Marty jumping on the bed. Woohoo! Go Red Sox! And how about that game last night? Anybody see it? Okay, we're going to start off with two. Um, my dad came out of rehearsal once. Uh, again, I think it was a bottle of bourbon. He said, come on, guys. Write a, write, a, write a song. Write a song. Not just play a song. Write a song. Okay, okay so we have to spontaneously come up with a song, compose a song. And this is the song we came up with. It's called Patience, Jules. Patience. 